to die, to sleep no more. And scene. Thank you. Uh, uh, you all are too kind. Thank you so much. Uh, but I guess we should get into it. Um, so, so thank you so much for coming, and thank you to the organizers for having me. Uh, so I spent the past couple of years uh, spending hundreds, perhaps thousands of hours uh, absorbing as much as I can about how different companies are scaling their security efforts. Uh, and not just the one-off ad hoc wins, but the truly uh, scalable, systematic wins that have enabled them to measurably improve their security posture. So my goal for this talk is to combine a vast amount of talks, tools, blog posts, and other resources, uh, as well as conversations I've had with people at like tens of companies into one resource so that you can see what uh, perhaps applies uh, most to you and then take it back to your company so we can all move forward together. Um, so you can think of this as sort of like a, a greatest hits of scaling security, at least as far as I'm aware across many companies. Uh, okay, so before we get into it, a little bit about me. Uh, so I'm a technical and research director at NCC Group. We do security consulting of pretty much anything. Uh, we also, uh, in terms of pen testing, web apps, networks, et cetera. Uh, also, we've been helping a number of companies uh, embrace DevSecOps with security automation and helping them define you know, what makes sense to invest in uh, in the near, medium, and far term. Uh, here are a bunch of things I like. Uh, if you're into those two, uh, let's chat. So again, in the main uh, slides as well as uh, copious backup slides, I'm going to be referencing a, a ton of things. Uh, so don't feel like you have to read uh, everything on every slide. You won't be able to. Uh, but this is being recorded, and I have a link to the slides on the last slide, um, so you can go uh, and review everything at your leisure. Um, so again, uh, this is going to be quick, and uh, there's probably almost a similar number of appendix slides as there are uh, main talk slides uh, that go into things in more detail. So just to give you a heads up. Uh, OK, so some assumptions before we start. Uh, so I assume that you found SAST and DAS probably not that useful. Uh, I'm not going to go into like my extensive reasoning why. But if you're using, um, say, dynamically typed languages like Python and Ruby, uh, microservices, um, things that tend to make um, these things hard, uh, you're like, ah, maybe um, we have other things that we should invest in, and we're going to talk about what. Um, I'm assuming you're willing to invest time now to have bigger wins later. And I'm assuming uh, you have a few people on your team, and you're interested in scaling, but you don't necessarily have, uh, say, hundreds of people already. So you're sort of somewhere in the middle. Uh, so again, I don't have time to go into it in detail, but in terms of SAST and DAST, um, you know, would you rather do like, very complex data flow analysis from backend code all the way through your JavaScript heavy front end, or do you want to just grep for dangerously set inner HTML, uh, which turns off output encoding in React, right? So basically having secure defaults and these lightweight adoption checks in practice tends to be easier and higher signal. Um, and again, sort of detecting the secure defaults can be much easier than actually finding bugs. It's sort of two sides of the same coin, but the, the effect is the same. Uh, so again, this is not a starting a security program talk, uh, but here's a bunch of excellent resources uh, if that's what you're doing. OK, so this talk basically has three main parts. Um, so the first is some big picture stuff, like how to think about things, uh, some mindsets and principles. Uh, and then the middle, which is the bulk of the talk, is um, sort of the, the fundamentals, like where do you start, and then how do you scale in the middle. And then uh, longer term, what are some uh, great high leverage things at the end? And then finally, uh, we'll tie it all together. OK, so first I think it's instructive to look at some mindsets and principles. So you can talk about a bunch of different tactics, but those may or may not apply at your company. So what are sort of some things that, regardless of the specific tactics, we can apply? Um, so I think people will agree with most of these already. right? So you're very limited uh, with person time, so you need to automate as much as possible. Uh, in most companies I've worked with, uh, you have to minimize the number of no's you say, or else you damage relationships with developers. So ideally, you're building guardrails. So how can we help developers do their work faster, easier, better, securely, uh, rather than you know like smashing a staff in the ground and, and saying you can't pass? Um, Asta has a great blog post on this, and we'll talk about some other resources soon. Uh, many companies I see are making the trade-off um, like we're fine missing some things with our tooling as long as when we report something, it's almost always right. So it's OK to have false negatives. We would rather reduce false positives. So that's one insight I've, I've seen a bunch of places. 
So when we are building a product, right, we uh, spend a lot of time having a nice uh, user interface and user experience. Uh, and I and many others would argue that as a security team, developers are our customers, right? So we need to spend time thinking about how we can make their lives better, right? Can we fit into their existing tools and workflow? Uh, can we make the secure way uh, easier, faster, and just better than the current way, right? When you tell someone to do something differently, that is an ask of them. So if we can give them a, a nice reason to do that, in addition to just, oh, it's more secure, um, you're more likely that they're going to do that. Uh, and one way to do that is to build additional useful features into it, like add some telemetry, logging, monitoring, things that they want anyway. Um, just uh, in, it's like, oh, it's more secure too. And so I wrote a blog post with more details. Um, so I wanted to make sure to connect with the youth. Um, so if the other slides had like so many words, um, <laughs> basically the, the theme of this talk, you know, finding individual bugs uh, is broke, but scalably reducing risk uh, is woke. Uh, so in life, as well as in security, you're always choosing between you know, focusing on things that matter now, like fighting fires now, versus the medium and long term. Uh, and I'm going to uh, push you very hard to focus more uh, on the long term. Specifically, uh, ask yourself, like, of the things I can do right now and in the medium term, uh, which of these is going to provide the most long term strategic value? Uh, and if you're working on something in the near term, can I do it a little bit differently so that it's even uh, or useful later, because sometimes you can make trade offs like that. Uh, another way that I think is useful to view it is, so when you're tackling problems, you have many tools in your tool belt, right? So you've got like static and dynamic analysis, you've got bug bounty, you've got pen tests, um, you've got secure wrapper libraries, uh, you can detect things at runtime. Uh, of course, fuzzing is like the saw, um, you're just <laughs> ripping through things. So, so when you're thinking about like what is something I want to achieve, uh, there's many different ways to do that. And I think the core intuition I'm trying to get across here is different approaches are fundamentally better or worse at solving specific classes of problems. So rather than saying like, how do I make tool X do better at what I'm trying to do, consider like maybe there is another approach that's just fundamentally better at, at solving that. And another point that I think is important is also choosing what to ignore is important, right? What are the fires that you can burn because you're prioritizing other things. Uh, okay, another way to think about things. Um, I like thinking about it in terms of like you can target a specific vulnerability class uh, as well as targeting by like complexity, right? So let's say easy uh, are things that you don't require a lot of uh, context or analysis complexity to be able to find reliably with high precision. Uh, medium is somewhere in the middle where it's like you need a little bit more complex analysis and then hard is like uh, this tool or approach would need to be very uh, in intelligent or complex to do a good job. Um, so here's just like some examples, right? Detecting if a service is using pretty easy. Similarly, uh, checking security headers. You don't need to know how the app works to see those things. You just need to look at the HTTP requests. Uh, and then in the middle, you have sort of your standard OWASP bugs. Uh, and then hard is like complex multi-step bugs, maybe business logic flaws, right? Like tools are generally not to, to be able to do that unless it understands your business logic or abusing built-in features. Um, so when you are uh, just starting a security program, uh, you might say, like, well, we don't have a lot of people or time, so maybe let's just buy tools and, and have that solve all of our problems. Uh, or maybe let's just pen test our way to security, right? So um, that's okay to start, but I think as you progress, your breakdown probably is, is going to want to look more like this. Um, so we can see like a heavy emphasis on secure defaults that are solving um, just categorically a lot of these easy issues and a lot of the medium and, and then some of the hard. Uh, and then automated tools, again, there's a lot of low context, um, low hanging fruit we can find pretty well. Uh, and then also some with medium, but not as much hard. Uh, in my experience, bug bounty does provide uh, a lot of value in catching some low hanging fruit, like easy and medium stuff, and some hard things. There are some people who are very, very good, um, but in my experience, that's not where you're gonna get the most coverage in practice. Uh, and then sort of the main value here of pen testing is, is catching the, the medium hard type issues. Uh, and then actually there's some things that just fundamentally you just can't really catch the others very effectively and really runtime monitoring um, can be useful there. So basically what I'm trying to say here is, uh, and you'll see this throughout the talk, but as many problems as possible with secure defaults, I think it is super high leverage and a great way to do. Um, automatically you're gonna solve all your problems regardless of what uh, vendor halls will tell you. 
Uh, bug bounty can give you some nice coverage. Uh, pen testing, like if, you're fine, if your pen test reports are like all sort of like these easy low hanging fruits, probably uh, you're not getting the most value. Just solve those issues so they can focus on the higher leverage stuff, um, like the harder things that can't be find, found with other approaches. Uh, and then again, runtime monitoring can be useful as well. Okay, so this is like my opinion. Let, let's see what other people think. Um, so this is a talk by uh, Asta and Patrick um, a couple years ago at AppSec Cali. So we can see here de-emphasized, uh, like manual testing, manual code review, uh, and so forth. And then heavily emphasized is uh, paved road, like secure defaults, uh, and killing bug classes. Right. So uh, this was a different talk uh, by Scott and Isha of Netflix last year. And, and notice how there's this big influ uh, emphasis on secure by defaults and how that's growing over time. Um, so I think there's a lot of value here. Uh, okay. So uh, let's talk about the fundamentals. Um, so by fundamentals, I don't mean things that are easy, because these are, in fact, extremely hard to do well. Uh, the reason they're the fundamentals is because if you build them, uh, you can sort of combine them and build things on top of them, which are very highly leveraged and um, like great uh, systematic wins later, hence fundamentals. OK, so vulnerability management. Um, this is essential for knowing like where are we now, and then when you do things, like did they actually work? Right? So there's many ideas that sound good, but then you may spend several quarters trying to do something and then find that it didn't measurably reduce your number of uh, vulnerabilities uh, in a given category. Um, so some success criteria here. right? So ideally, there's as little friction as possible. Uh, you should track all vulnerabilities in the same system, ideally the same one uh, that devs use, like Jira. Um, Regardless of how you find the vulnerabilities, it should go through the same sort of triage workflow. Uh, and you also want to track relevant metadata. Um, so which metadata you want to track probably varies by organization, but here's some things to get you started. Um, so which code base is it in and which team and org is responsible? Uh, what vulnerability class? Uh, this is really important. Um, so this, uh, we're going to show some examples. It lets you do um, some nice like data-driven decisions in terms of what do we invest in from an AppSec or CloudSec team point of view. Uh, also, you know, how, what was the impact, and severity, uh, and risk for these things, uh, and also how was it found, right? Like, over time, you're going to see, oh, you know, uh, these tools or, or bug bounty is, you know, providing us a lot of value in this respect, but maybe less so in another. Uh, and there's some other things that are useful to grab, but I would say are not as essential in terms of, like, what caused this issue, uh, what was the pull request introducing as well as fixing it, uh, and other mitigating factors. Okay, so that's sort of the basics uh, over time. Uh, ideally, you're automating parts of the vulnerability ingestion and triage process. And it can also be nice to create a dashboard uh, that gives you a sort of quick, easy insight into um, by project, team, and org, basically like how are we doing? You know, uh, what's on fire? Uh, what's doing OK? And a couple of companies have talked about how by making these dashboards visible, it puts some nice friendly pressure on different teams and different execs to uh, basically improve the security posture of their systems, right? So if it's uh, just a bunch of issues in JIRA that are hard to query, hard to gain insight into how things are doing, um, that doesn't impact change. While if it's very visibly apparent, um, then people can start taking action on it. And here are some talks. Uh, we're going to see a couple of um, figures from this data-driven bug bounty talk um, that Arcady gave soon. So here's an example risk dashboard from Domino's. This was um, AppSec USA 2018. And so basically for each service, um, for each like microservice components that make it up, here's like some various metrics. And uh, you don't need to know anything technical, technical. You just get very easy insight into like, you know, where should I focus time? Uh, here's another one from uh, Netflix last year. So you can see like what different security controls have each of these services adopted, uh, what is our risk classification, what team owns it, and then you can sort of slice and dice by a bunch of tags and other things. Uh, OK, so continuous scanning. So the core idea here is we want to be able to scan new code with static and dynamic analysis. Um, basically, everyone agrees it probably breaks down like this, where you're doing static analysis um, on potentially developer machines, but then as well as code hosting. And then um, like Zap, Burp, and other type uh, black box web app scanning and fuzzing in a, a testing QA environment. Um, so uh, this is a very popular idea, probably one of the most consistent ones I've seen across many companies. Um, so it turns out people are talking a lot about it. Um, so these are only talks that are um, 
specifically about like the the overall pipeline. There's like many subparts within it uh, that are like other talks, but these are these are all sort of like on the same thing. And we see uh, at least eight talks here, and there's probably many I don't know about. So while the specific details uh, are different, uh, generally the following principles are agreed upon by uh, almost everyone. So focusing on iteration speed, right? Adding and removing tools uh, as well as testing new rules should be uh, as fast and easy as possible. So in terms of static analysis, what do you scan? Uh, the basic unit generally is pull request. Uh, every commit turns out being uh, too noisy. Some of them are work in progress commits or things that get thrown away. So like, why, why uh, alert on those? Ideally, scans are fast and give feedback within the system uh, developers use. Um, for example, like on the pull request. Um, so if you want to do like a longer, deeper scan, that's okay to do maybe daily or weekly asynchronously. But it's nice to have something quick that happens uh, while the developer is still thinking about it. Ideally, you're focusing on high signal checks, things that if they find something, it's almost always right. So when you don't do that, again, developers um, start disliking you. And really importantly is this is too much continuous operational time cost uh, for the security team. You can invest in other things. Uh, make sure to capture metrics, right? So what are we finding? Like what classes of issues are very common and false positive rate and other things are good too. You'll need some logic for deduplicating issues um, and like whitelisting, like, hey, I know it's reporting this, but it's not a thing. Um, and overall, a point I want to make is uh, being able to basically map reduce uh, over all of your code, as well as live systems. Doing dynamic testing is super useful. Uh, and we're going to see some examples of that in a second. OK, so in terms of like how to think about this space, here's some other talks uh, that I think are pretty good. Um, I wanted to get into this a lot more detail. I just don't have time. Um, but if you want uh, some talks on basically writing your own custom lightweight static analysis, so not like full data flow, but using abstract syntax tree matching uh, to find like business logic flaws and things like that, um, there's some cool talks on that by uh, Justin Collins, uh, author of Breakman, as well as myself in the appendix slides, uh, where I also talk about this uh, in more detail. And uh, also, if you are curious how like Google, Facebook, and other big players, like people who have teams of program analysis PhDs working on things, like what they choose to focus on, uh, I have some content on that in the back as well. Um, OK, so we spent a while talking about the how uh, of continuously scanning. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about what to look for. I always hoped that I would get a better response for this image. Uh, <laughs> But out of the two times I've used it, uh, the, both responses were mediocre. So I'm, I'm taking that feedback in. Uh, OK, so I'm going to talk about a, looking for a couple of different things in both static as well as dynamic analysis. I can't go into detail uh, now about them, but I have basically each point I'm about to make, I have like a slide or more about in the appendix. OK, so it can be useful to look for, say, uh, banned or dangerous functions. Um, so let's say. Like, hey, my company, we're just not going to let anyone shell exec. Or if they do, they have to use a secure wrapper library. So we just sort of eliminate classes of issues. Um, and Mozilla released some tools that look for dangerous things uh, as ESLint plugins. Uh, you can also look for security relevant code additions, right? So these aren't necessarily bugs. But like, hey, it looks like you're starting to add some crypto stuff. Like, let's, let's chat about that. What are you trying to do? Um, perhaps there are certain sensitive files or directories that don't change very often. Um, for example, the auth-z or auth-n or maybe a uh, login flow. Like, hey, um, like we want to make sure that you're not introducing a bug here. So maybe it's not a bug in itself. Like it's not XSS necessarily. But as a security team, we want to know. Uh, and of course, looking for out-of-date dependencies uh, is very useful. Uh, and here's a bunch of tools that are um, not too shabby. OK, so for dy dynamic analysis, I think there's a lot of value in ensuring a security baseline, right? So we're not necessarily trying to find every bug. We're not finding like complex like five-step um, SQL injection or things like that. We're just like, are you, um, you know, tying your shoelaces? Are you doing the basic right things, right? So are you using TLS with strong ciphers? You have the right headers and, and things like this that you can check across any service, regardless of backend tech stack it's use, uh, using or uh, regardless of application. There's some things that should just always be true. Um, automating tests for regressions can be uh, nice and high signal. So every time bug bounty, pen tests, and so forth find a bug, add a unit test with a payload that makes sure that you don't regress in the future. Uh, you'd be surprised how common this is in practice for regressions to happen. Uh, and if you're writing in uh, CC++, you can uh, automatically fuzz as well. It can be nice. Um, OK, so uh, this first talk is nice in a way that it, it discusses like what are some fundamental challenges for DAST having good coverage. And I think it breaks that down pretty nicely. Um, Julian from uh, the Mozilla team 
uh, has some nice talks on um, sort of dynamic testing security baselines. And I want to emphasize this talk by Zane. Um, it's one of my favorite talks uh, out of hundreds of talks I have watched on sort of modern AppSec best practices. Um, so I, I would highly encourage you to check that out if you haven't. Okay, so what are some key takeaways for continuous scanning? Um, ideally, you're going to build the capability to scan every pull request, code base, as well as deployed service. Um, these checks ideally are high signal only. Uh, again, we're not trying to find every bug, we're just trying to ensure a security baseline. Um, and in addition to looking for bugs, you can also look for uh, security controls or security relevant changes uh, or the lack thereof. Okay, so last uh, fundamental. So what is asset inventory? Like it depends who you ask. Um, to me, it's a list of things you own, like uh, your code, servers, databases, uh, everything. Um, if you were to look at various like companies and um, tools, I think this generally falls into these like three buckets. There's like subcategories within, um, but basically one is your black box uh, looking at network based from outside um, using OSN uh, search transparency and other things to figure out what a company owns. Or you could similarly be network focused, but from a white box approach, say you give a tool access to your, um, like a read only AWS key, and then it sort of programmatically reads like, oh, here's your um, load balancers and EC2 instances and so forth. Um, or there's like a white box holistic method where um, you're like giving it a GitHub API token and uh, all these other different things and then it basically hits all the APIs and then represents things together. Okay, so again, this is about knowing what you own and how the different pieces connect. So I would encourage you to start with focusing on just like code and cloud related things. So one way to do this is to have like a YAML code owner's file or, or something like that in every repo, which just says, you know, this is the team that owns it, this is the team lead, uh, here's the security person in charge of it, and sort of meta information like that. Uh, and then for cloud-related assets, you know, what servers do we control and databases, what services are we using, um, what sort of creds are out there, what are our permission model look like, uh, as well as like network stuff. Uh, and then gradually, over time, you can build capabilities to get visibility into other assets. You know, what of our, all of our employees? Maybe you hook into um, Workday or other HR systems. Uh, maybe you keep track of your phones and laptops as well. Uh, one thing that I think is very neat that requires some coordination across various services is, can you track code in where you're hosting it all the way to where it's deployed in QA and staging, all the way to where it's actually running in production? Um, so we'll look at some cool things you can do if you can do that. Um, also, if you want some sort of programmatic insight into what security relevant things developers are working on, you could try scraping like Jira or Slack or things like that to see maybe like tags or key, key terms. And, and being able to query across multiple knowledge domains uh, is very powerful. So there's been a couple of talks on this. Um, I think uh, Sasha's uh, Lyft cartography tool, which has been open sourced, uh, is pretty neat, as well as um, Erkang uh, talks about what they've been building uh, in their sort of product. Um, but basically the idea is like take all of your assets, uh, turn those into nodes in a graph database, and then have edges between them based on relationships. So like what does that look like? Um, so this is uh, from the cartography tool. So basically we see um, each of the pink uh, circles is an AWS account, and then the red things are like RDS instances. Um, so you could imagine for each type of object and asset you control, um, you could graphically represent how they relate and then do graph queries. Uh, so like, what are some things you could find? You could say, hey, what are all of my RDS instances that don't have encryption turned on? Uh, which EC2 instances are directly exposed to the internet? Right. So this is sort of your uh, outer uh, attack surface. Uh, but let's look at a, a bit more complicated example. So let's say you're running some thing like struts. Uh, you might know <laughs> where this is going. So let's say there's a new critical bug. Uh, it has a cool logo and it has an awesome name. Um, so as a security team, you are uh, less than pleased. Uh, and let's say there's been a curl POC released that if you run it against a service, you uh, can determine if it's vulnerable or not. So, so let's say you know, this happened. Um, if you have your sort of fundamental asset inventory in place, what can you do? So first, you could say, OK, cool. You know, show me all of the uh, different uh, servers that I own, um, ideally that are internet facing. Then using the continuous scanning sort of MapReduce infrastructure that we talked about before, you could run this pull request against all of them, get those results, and then slice and dice to figure out, OK, which of these are actually vulnerable? Uh, and then you could say, OK, for all the vulnerable servers, which code base responds to that service running on those servers? And then from there, you could say, OK, well, what is the team lead who owns that repo? 
And then you could say, let's send them an email, a Slack message, or uh, issue them a JIRA ticket to like, hey, this is critical. You need to fix this as soon as possible. So basically, we took a um, you know, uh, sort of fire drill type event um, in terms of an in incident response scenario and took the discovering where we're affected, figuring out where we need to fix, and then telling who needs to fix it. Like this whole process could be uh, you know, like tens of minutes rather than uh, days uh, of not seeing your partner uh, and, and tears. Um, so, so this is an example for incident response, but there's many other applications. This is just sort of one illustrative example. Um, OK, so let's talk about scaling your efforts. So you have uh, have some nice like baseline stuff done. How do we uh, scale this? OK, so a couple different places. So uh, one common challenge is, hey, we want to do threat modeling, but if we threat model every story, we, that's all we'll do. right? So uh, across like many talks and companies, uh, there seems to be three primary buckets of how people do this. Uh, so one is having some self-service security questionnaires, uh, where basically uh, you're building a new feature or a new service, and you're like, okay, um, you know, what sensitive data am I going to touch? Um, you know, do I need to parse XMLs or URLs or things that are potentially security sensitive? And then it gives you contextual advice, like, hey, you're using Python, make sure you worry about this. Um, and then uh, it sort of gives the security team an intuition as to like how risky this thing is going to be. Um, you could also try adding a lightweight threat modeling into the SD, SDLC itself. So during, uh, say, sprint planning, you could say, hey, after you talk about what it needs to do, you should also say, um, you know, how could this be abused? And then how could we prevent that abuse? Things like that. And then there's this, also this idea of threat model as code. Um, so I have uh, multiple slides in the back uh, for each of these. I don't have time to talk about it now. Uh, but the basic point is, uh, then as the security team, you just get involved in whatever is highest risk. Uh, so again, you don't have time to threat model everything. You need to prioritize. Um, depending on your company, one or more of these things may be better or worse. Uh, and then again, meet with teams uh, on the stuff that's highest impact. OK, so let's talk about security engineering. So the idea here is building libraries, tools, and other services that are secure by default for developer teams to use. Um, so if we think back to the early 2000s, uh, I think web security was sort of the Wild West, right? And in my opinion, one of the uh, biggest, most impactful reasons why uh, cross-site scripting and CSERF and SQL injection are less, uh, not as common today is because frameworks have gotten better and object relational mappers exist and things like that. So it's, it's easier to build uh, hardened, secure libraries that everyone uses than teaching everyone how to output and code securely, right? Uh, writing your own super hard. Um, so where do you uh, consider investing? What are some topics that are valuable? So anything related to secrets, crypto, auth n, auth z, um, things like that. So just like some case studies. Um, so talking with various uh, friends of mine at different companies, one of them ported uh, their front end to React, and that essentially killed cross-site scripting. Uh, another wrote a, a data model wrapper library, which basically killed SQL injection. Um, so the, the key point here is if something is hard to do securely, Right? If you need to know, you know this thread or that thread, to, like, if you have to like, uh, dodge all the booby traps in order to not screw things up, just build a secure by default uh, implementation. Um, so hitch your security wagon to developer productivity. Um, so again, the secure version hopefully has an even better uh, dev UX than the old way. And also integrate security at the right points. Right? So for example, if there's new project starter templates where if you're going to make a new microservice, you just fork this and, and then start from there. If you put security stuff into there, then everyone who uses those gets your security stuff by default. Right? Uh, you don't have to convince them. They're just, it's already there. So one talk that I think is very nice about this is uh, Morgan Romans. Um, and he talks about how DocuSign eliminated several classes of vulnerabilities uh, via the following approach basically like finding a bad pattern, uh, building a safe version, uh, and making it the default, training people how to use it, uh, and then building sort of lightweight static analysis, basically just grips to say, uh, you know, hey, you're using this insecure version. Like, use this one instead. Um, so he, he describes it really well. Uh, OK, um, so you're probably familiar with config management tools like Puppet, Chef, and Ansible. So some companies are taking this like one step further. So rather than just describing how your infrastructure should look, you're also uh, specifying your compliance expectations as code. Right? So this service either must or must not be running. Uh, this version uh, must be running, uh, and so forth. So uh, Chef Inspect is one tool. Uh, Capital One has Cloud Custodian as well. Um, 
So here's a couple talks on it. Um, another idea that's pretty interesting is uh, scanning your infrastructure as code. Um, so here's some scripts that do sort of security linting of Terraform, CloudFormation, and IAM policies to find sort of places where you may um, have messed up a little bit. Like, oh, this is an insecure configuration. You probably shouldn't do that. OK, so again, automating compliance. Ideally, it's not a static spreadsheet. You always have to uh, keep up to date and then scan these things. OK, so detection and response. Uh, we'll talk about a couple different ideas here. Um, so one uh, is having like an IR bot. Uh, so this was originally talked by, uh, discussed by um, Ryan Huber of Slack. So basically, uh, when someone does something fishy, rather than sending all these alerts to the SOC team, instead prompt the person who initiated the potentially sketchy activity and say, hey, you just did something sensitive. Was this actually you? Um, and then if they say yes, you know, send them a 2FA uh, to confirm it's them. So what I think is cool about this is not only is it freeing up AppSec engineer time, we can see that Slack talked about it, Dropbox wrote a blog post about it and then released their tool. And then we see Pinterest a year later uh, talking in at AppSec USA about it. So it's sort of cool to watch ideas percolate across companies. Um, so this was a blog post by Dropbox on how they do threat detection. Um, so basically, uh, when something sketchy happens, Kafka issues an alert um, to this other service called Alertbox, which, so they have uh, logging and monitoring data in like all these sorts of systems. So basically, it's grabbing relevant context from all these different systems, putting them in one place. Um, then Forerunner is uh, running this Jupyter Notebook and uh, sort of putting everything in one place uh, for the analyst, who then can, um, using various APIs in a Jupyter Notebook, explore and investigate an incident. So this is repeatable because the steps that you should do for each um, type of event uh, are documented in the notebook. And uh, also, like whatever the analyst did is automatically documented um, so that they can review uh, later. Um, so it's basically anything they would have always had to do to investigate a certain type of instance, they can just, um, all that happens automatically, so they can do the stuff that humans are good at. Sort of a similar idea, uh, Twilio released a tool called Sockless, where um, they have a security run book that basically says, for this type of event, do this. So rather than having a human uh, have to uh, respond to, say, a bunch of alerts that come in at the same time, you just spin up a bunch of lambdas that do it for you. Um, so they released this tool, and uh, some things they did with it, for example, like, hey, you just got a phishing email. Um, you know, this is what you should do. If something is anomalous in their cloud environment, uh, you can do that as well. Uh, so this is a blog post by someone at Microsoft that I think was uh, quite clever. Uh, and the core idea is, as an industry, we are developing insights within one company, but we're not necessarily sharing as effectively as we can across companies. So the idea is, OK, let's figure out common attack patterns and define them in something like uh, MITRE's attack. Then let's determine various uh, detection definitions in, say, Sigma, some language that's a uh, tool agnostic. Uh, and then have Jupyter run books that document the uh, best of breed practices in terms of like how do you respond to this type of alert. So basically, by documenting all this context and security best practices in various systems that can then be shared between companies rather than uh, within one company, we can more effectively move forward as a community. Um, so, so I really liked this uh, blog post. So I would encourage you to check it out. So some key takeaways. Uh, document run books for how to respond to things. Automate them. Uh, any context gathered automatically. And ideally, if you can push the first triage to teams that are bigger than yours, for example, developers, uh, that's nice to do. OK, so I spent uh, a lot of money on a, a graphic artist to represent a security endgame because I wanted uh, some flashy infographics for you all. Um, so this is what they came up with. Um, yeah, so, so in the long term, let's, let's look at what we can do. Um, uh, so one of my favorite uh, tools and talks is by uh, my friend Travis. Um, so basically, a new application at Netflix uh, gets a base set of permissions. The API calls it makes are watched. And then if it has permissions it doesn't need based on its actual behavior, it then removes those. right? So with no uh, uh, security team interaction, it becomes least privileged over time. And if it's not used, permissions go to zero. Um, so pretty awesome. Uh, recently, uh, someone from Salesforce released a tool called Policy Sentry, which comes at it from the other angle. So the goal of this is more to make uh, least, privileged po least privileged policies in the first place rather than take away permissions later. OK, so let's look at why this is so awesome in a bit more detail. Um, so the ongoing time requirements from the security team are basically none other than maintaining the tool. But the security benefit uh, and the risk reduction is massive, right? 
So anytime you can find opportunities like this, you should absolutely take them. Uh, and if you think about it, what we're doing here is we're, we're trying to maximize this ratio of like security benefit to the ongoing time requirements uh, for the security team to do this. So anything you can just build and you get security value like forever, uh, this is a huge win. OK, so let's talk about targeting specific vulnerability classes. So this is a figure from uh, Arcady's data-driven bug bounty talk. So if you are keeping track of like, which vulnerability class issues are, over time, you can get charts like this to say, like, oh, we should probably try solving these ones. Uh, so this is a case study from a, a project I did uh, for NCC Group. Uh, a couple of companies came to us saying, hey, we're not getting a lot of value out of our SaaS. Can you, can you make us uh, less sad? Um, and so what they were asking is, like, how do we get more value from SAST? Um, and if we try to make that a little bit more specific, I think what you're really asking is, you know, how do we find more bugs of higher criticality with like, less manual time, like if we were to make this more specific? Um, but if you think about it and take a step back, uh, really what we care about is like, finding more bugs regardless of approach. Um, but really, at the end of the day, if we take another uh, bigger step back, the, the question I think all of us are asking is, given limited AppSec engineer time and budget, how do we reduce overall risk? Right? This isn't even necessarily about finding bugs. Um, yeah, so it's not tool or approach specific, really. OK, so how to do this at your company. Um, so basically what we did is look at all of your vulnerabilities across uh, a number of quarters, maybe like two years. You're grouping by vulnerability class as well as how you found them. Uh, and probably you want to wait by like, how severe the issue is. Uh, and then basically, like, what can find or present, uh, prevent these issues at scale? So we're trying to minimize cost in terms of licensing and paying researchers, as well as time. Right? Operational time is very important as well. So is maybe one method finding uh, your most high severity vulns? Uh, and also, are there any organizational wins that you can learn from and leverage? So again, another figure from our Katie's talk. So you could say, like, oh, like, is there a specific approach that's finding the most of our issues? Uh, and maybe certain tools. Uh, most of the findings are going to like won't fixed or, or duplicate. So like maybe we should deprioritize or uh, better prioritize other things. So let's walk through one like hypothetical example. Let's say you do a time audit uh, of your company and you figure out uh, of your AppSec team and you're like, okay, this is what we spend time on. We spend maybe like a third of our time on various XSS related things. We sort of run security tools and here's things that we currently what we spend time on. So you're like, hey, we spent a lot of time on XSS. Let's like drill down into that a bit. So uh, when you look into it, you're like, oh, OK, so we're training developers about cross-site scripting for a couple of hours a month. We're, we're triaging bug bounty submissions. We're making sure they're fixed properly. We're you know, working with SAST and DAST. Like, all of these things are continuous, ongoing, uh, recurring time uh, that you're having to spend on this one issue. But instead, if you were to say, port all of your front-end code to React and then just ban the way to make it unsafe, you know, like profit, uh, all of these things that you used to be spending on time on, you don't have to anymore. Um, again, this is sort of a simplistic example, but I think conceptually you get it. So basically, what we used to spending time on, uh, then we then, uh, you know, basically free up a third of our time to do anything else, right? So we can then take that time that we used to be spending on this one class of issue that we've categorically solved, and then we can say, oh, we're spending uh, a lot of time manually running security tools. Um, so, you know, let's just knock those out, right? And so the point here is we're we're systematically, um, scalably becoming more effective and higher leveraged as a team over time. Uh, essentially, we're building uh, like an AppSec snowball, right, where we're getting more and more effective. Uh, and one way I like to think about this is security engineering is kind of like the compound interest of security. You're putting in time now, um, and you may not see a lot of immediate benefits, but over time, you're getting some huge wins. Um, and also, I just wanted to call out that uh, quoting yourself uh, is kind of awkward. Uh, of course, Gandhi said that. Um, so uh, again, using your vulnerability history uh, is very useful. Um, yeah, so uh, I've been getting some messages that I need to speed it up. So uh, let's just keep going. Um, so one thing that I think is very powerful is Enforcing invariance. Basically, what are things about your environment that should either always or never be true? And, and because there's no context that's needed to be required to uh, make this decision, uh, you can just automatically uh, do it. 
right? So for example, if every route should do some sort of authorization check, uh, so one company has a test case that will automatically introspect on the code and fail the test uh, if there's no auth check. Uh, similarly, maybe you should never make uh, changes to the AWS console because you use Terraform. So boom, let's just like alert on that. Here's a blog post that describes how. Maybe CloudTrail should always be on. So you set up a Lambda uh, that will auto re-enable it. I know a couple of companies doing that. Um, similarly, maybe uh, you should just never have something accessible to everywhere on the internet. Um, so here's a blog post uh, by Datadog talking about doing that. Um, again, just things that are like, what should always be the case? Um, so for Netflix, uh, this talk um, uh, by Travis and Will, last episode, Cali, I really like. Like, we never use these regions. We never use these services. So if anyone ever tries to do that, like, let me know. That's weird. Uh, you could also do this per app or per service. Uh, similarly, maybe there's a Bastion host uh, that you should always go through. Or maybe, like, this is our Crown Jewels uh, database. Like, if it's ever closer than three hops from the broader internet, like, let me know. Um, because we want to someone has to compromise multiple steps to get there. So the key takeaways here. Um, you know, what are things in your environment that should always, uh, always or never be true? Uh, which of these can you programmatically enforce and alert on? Uh, and again, the insight here is if you don't need context to make the decision, there's no ongoing operational time. So again, we are knocking out as many of these things as we can so we can be higher leveraged. So how is what we're doing now making us more effective in the future? And if it's not, I would consider deprioritizing it. Uh, again, He's a wise dude. Um, OK, so uh, quantifying risk. So you've built all these wonderful things, right? So basically, all of these feed together into a per app uh, and per service risk rating. Um, and then that can help you inform, like, where do I focus my time? Right? So again, some figures from Arcadi's talk. Hey, uh, this team has by far the most open vulnerabilities. We should help see if there's some strategic uh, endemic reasons why they need help. Um, average time to fix by team. Like, can we help a team become more effective uh, at fixing issues? So uh, what factors you include in your risk scoring uh, depends on your organization. Here's like some examples. Um, you know, how important this, is this to the business? Does it have a bunch of open vulnerabilities? Does it touch sensitive data? Um, and various like cloud-related things as well. Uh, but really the biggest thing here is uh, measuring risk is super hard. Uh, this could be, you know, like days and days of lecture in itself. But here's some things to read up on. Uh, and sort of a hard truth is businesses don't really care about security uh, overall. They care about risk, right? risks to the business. So if you can quantify this risk in, in a dollar amount, I think that that can be very valuable for getting execs on board. Uh, and here's like the Beyond Corp and Beyond Prod uh, white papers Google and others have talked about. Um, whew, OK, that was a lot. Um, OK, so um, just quickly agree on what you should capture. Capture it consistently, uh, minimize friction, and all that good stuff. Create a dashboard uh, going forward. Um, you know, look at your da data. Like, are open vulns going down over time? Uh, for continuous scanning, um, you know, just scan every each of these units. Uh, decide on a baseline of things to scan for. It doesn't have to be everything. That's okay. Uh, and then eventually, you know, check for the lack of your uh, use of uh, various security controls. Uh, Again, don't boil the ocean. Focus on things that you can solve uh, with high signal, um, with little sort of ongoing operational time. Um, again, what do you own and how do they connect? Uh, you want to capture all this programmatically. If it's manually, you just uh, don't have time. Um, then choose like one or two projects that'll take like a month, a couple of months to do. Nothing too big that you can start seeing um, uh, some measurable wins as you become more effective. Um, then do some more ambitious projects, uh, for example, becoming more highly leveraged? Um, you know, what are some high security ROI things? Um, OK, just finally, uh, thank you, everyone, who uh, did work that gave back to the community. I learned a ton. Um, if you like AppSec Cali, uh, I spent a, a bajillion of my personal hours uh, summarizing all of them. So feel free to check that out. Uh, I have a newsletter with like talk summaries and other things uh, that at least one person doesn't think is horrible. <laughs> Uh, and um, yeah, so uh, feel free to chat. Uh, this first thing is a, a link to the slides. There's like an underscore that's hidden uh, by the underlining. Um, but yeah, and here's like a reference to everything we talked about to, uh, to prompt your questions. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for your time. Yeah,
questions if you want to take questions. OK, cool. Uh, and we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah. You mentioned not allowing manual changes in the AWS console. Could you just repeat that concept and what would be the alternative? Yeah, uh, so the question was uh, not allowing manual actions in uh, AWS console. So uh, if you're using a tool such as uh, Terraform, which um, basically specifies in code how to set everything up, um, if you have agreed upon uh, as an organization that this is how we're going to do things, then all the changes could be done via Terraform scripts so that no one manually needs to do that. So you have like auditability of changes and uh, you know that your current environment matches exactly what you've defined. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, any other questions? Yeah. Just wondering, uh, have you, uh, have you uh, encountered robotic process automation to automate some of these tasks? Robotic process automation? Um, yeah, so you said uh, robotic process automation to handle some of these tasks? Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, most of the things I described were uh, ideally uh, automated scripts, like in terms of uh, scanning uh, code and um, like services as they're deployed. Uh, all of those are ideally um, scripts and tools and things like that. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, there's, so there's definitely um, uh, Selenium, Headless, Chrome, and other things that can uh, automatically uh, interact with applications. Um, yeah, I, I see that. One, one challenge with codifying, like interacting with a, a web UI is um, you have to uh, do that per application, which if you have hundreds of apps, that can be uh, not very scalable. But I think that is a very good approach for, uh, for example, testing for regressions in specific uh, web app vulnerabilities, for example. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, so one of my questions is, I mean, one of my soapboxes is content security policy, and I saw you mention it out there. Um, is, do you know of any good way to automate this determining what your content security policy should be? Because I find a lot of people are like, oh, the tool says to do it, okay, I'll stick it there, inline, and I'm done. And it's like, once you've done inline, you might as well not have done it at all. Yeah, so I think uh, that's a very good question um, regarding uh, doing content security policy more easily um, or generating it automatically. CSP is a hill that many security professionals have uh, perished on. I think uh, it's miserable in practice to do well in a meaningful way. Um, there was a, a academic paper as well as a couple of talks by the Google team uh, who has like multiple people dedicated full time to, to doing CSP. Um, and I chatted with one of them at a happy hour after a conference and, and they said, hey, as someone who does CSP full time, like if you aren't willing to commit that sort of time, like probably don't do it. Like it's a huge amount of work. Um, and I've heard that from many, many people. Um, I heard there was a talk at either AppSec USA or EU a couple of years ago about using um, strict dynamic to, um, I, I forget the details, uh, but that can make it a little bit easier. Uh, but yeah, fundamentally, if you have third party JavaScript dependencies that use eval, inline, and other things, like you need them to be compliant before you can do anything mean, meaningful from a CSP point of view. Um, so, so that was a lot of words. To summarize, uh, CSP can be very powerful, but it's easy to have a policy that doesn't give you any value in practice that can be bypassed, uh, and it's a huge amount of work. So it can be useful, but it's hard. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll chat more about it, but that, that's sort of my TLDR. Yeah, uh, any other questions? Uh, cool, well, I'm uh, around all day, and I would love to chat with you. So thanks for your time. <laughs>